Let's talk mighty Therians and nomadic Hyperians, Teki Emir and aggressive Kronos. Which Rotan League will your dwarves hail from? Hello and welcome back to All Specs Tactics, where today we're talking Dwarves and Votan once more. Today I thought we'd go through the leagues in a bit more detail, a bit of lore for the various flavours of Votan, how they play in game, and how they rack up power-wise. As a new faction within the game, it's interesting to explore the differences and contrasts between the sub-factions of Votan, and the different ways in which these mercantile space dwarves push their empires towards greater material wealth, deeper knowledge, and how their forces might take to the battlefield. With the Leagues of Botan Codex, there's five major leagues, each one of them perhaps epitomising a different facet of the faction. First up, we have the Great Ethereum League. These are the ones that we've been seeing in the vast majority of all the promo shots in the TL armour, and it does seem that they may be falling into the more default and more well-rounded archetype, perhaps similar to Ultramarines for Space Marines or Black Legion for Chaos. In the background, the Great Ethereum League are the largest of the leagues, with 200 allied holds and kindreds, and particularly vast in terms of military and economic resources with which they have to bring to bear. They see themselves as the epitome of what it is to be kin, ever seeking to grow and expand their prospects in any way that makes sense, whether it's economic or military. The Great Ethereum League are uncompromisingly mercenary, making war or trade whenever it is in their interests, bringing their massive military might to bear when it makes sense, but have no qualms in abandoning a venture if it no longer appears to be profitable. On the battlefield, their fighting style is balanced and pragmatic, they usually have the resources to bring the exact right tools for the task in hand, and their carls and leaders are particularly famed with their efficiency of command. One of their most prominent leaders is Uthar the Destined, a high carl foretold by prophecy by the Votan themselves, and is one of the most notable heroes and leaders of the faction, wielding the mighty blade of the ancestors. In game, the Great Ethereum League seems to be one of the stronger leagues of Botan. They get a single re-roll to hit or wound each time they attack, and they count as two models on objectives, both of which are kind of handy. I think perhaps their biggest draw, though, is their Ancestral Judgment, which means that every time they attack a unit with a Judgment token or two, they count it as having one additional. If you usually would have been auto-wounding on a 6, then that'll be on a 5, and if it was on a 5, it would be a 4 now. This perhaps makes them the best faction for really exploiting the massive damage that Judgment Tokens get, while they seem to be perhaps the strongest ability out of the whole Codex. It means they can really easily just focus down one enemy unit and have their entire army auto-wounding it on force to hit. On top of that, they've got a Warlord trait that allows them a 5 plus chance to regenerate spent CP. With the powerful Votan stratagems, that seems near auto-include, and it can stack with a Grimnir's Command Point regeneration spell. Relics-wise, they have Corvix Kiras. It grants a 4 plus invul and makes AP an extra 1 worse against one target. Could be okay on an Iron Hair champion, maybe. That would have him saving AP minus 3 on a 3 plus. Finally, for one command point, they have Appraising Glare. A Carl's Grim efficiency gives you an extra judgment token on a unit, and that means that combined with the League's Ancestral Judgment, you'd usually have your entire army auto wounding on a 4 plus against that enemy unit for the whole rest of the game. Really powerful, and armies with big units like Knights would absolutely hate that. Strength-wise, I think the Great Ethereum League are one of the stronger ones. The reroll is great with powerful shots such as rail weapons, and just adds extra damage all around. Extra CP from the Warlord trait is awesome, and the ability to get the 4 plus to auto wounds so easily is very, very powerful indeed. Perhaps standout units for the faction are the Carl to hand out those judgment tokens, the rail weapons for the rerolls, and basically any unit that really likes those judgment token damage boosts, mass low strength attacks, say from Hearthkin Warriors, seem like they'd be particularly potent, wounding on a 4 plus. Next up, we have the Cronus Hegemony, a newly independent and militaristic league. Their Votan only achieved self awareness and sentience less than a millennium ago. The fact that they've achieved such prominence over this relatively short time span is pretty notable. Kindreds within their league seem to be fanatical in their expansion efforts. And when new kindreds choose to join, they are imposed a debt of conquest. It will be their duty to expand the hegemony even further. Out of all the leagues, the Cronus hegemony places by far the most value on the military, their society almost entirely revolving around their armed forces, weapons and supplies, and they are unusually quick to solve just about every dispute with either a show of force or open war, which on more than one occasion has led them into conflict with the other leagues. While they might be bad neighbours at most times, their presence is certainly welcomed on the War Council when the kin are threatened by an external Xenos force. In battle, the hegemony have exceptional skill in melee combat, often choosing to employ plasma blades, concussion gauntlets, and mighty mass hammers as their preferred methods of breaking the foe. Their berserks and iron here are widely feared for their sheer ferocity. This translates well into game, where their custom will give them a plus one attack and plus one strength boost in the first round of melee, 
pretty powerful on just about any unit. Even the Hearthkin Warriors look fairly threatening with three attacks at strength five. This is also particularly powerful on Einheer Hearthguard or Chthonian Berserks, both of which appreciate both buffs. On top of that, if they can get two Judgment Tokens on a unit, their combat attacks also get an extra AP minus one. Not at all bad on mid AP concussion weapons with AP minus two. Otherwise, the rest of their abilities kind of double down on this. Their Warlord trait gives you plus one attack and plus one to wound when fighting characters or monsters, as well as re-rolling all hits in melee. The character and monster thing is situational but good, but really the re-rolling hits is pretty massive for Votan. It'll give you far more chance of auto wounds, and it combos really nicely with the Iron Hair Champion's Exactor Relic, the one that can give them D3 plus 3 mortal wounds on a 6 to hit. Their relic is called the Just Blade, a replacement for a Plasma Axe, Strength plus 1, AP minus 4, and damage 2, ignoring Imbles. Not a terrible upgrade for a Karl, though I think that the others are still very tempting. Finally, they also have a 1 command point stratagem for 6s to hit to cause 1 extra hit in melee. It's an okay damage boost, but as per the core rules, that won't necessarily trigger further judgement token things, so those extra hits will have to roll to wound. Certainly powerful enough to be usable, but it isn't going to double down on the judgement token things. Overall, I feel like the Cronus Germany are maybe moderate in power, their melee is pretty spectacular, they do make the Iron Hair and the Chthonian Berserks ridiculously scary if they can get to combat, though both units being relatively slow and this league not giving them any additional ways of getting there, it's going to make them a bit all or nothing depending on whether or not they make it. In general though, if you do want to try and make a very heavy melee build for Botan work, this seems to be the way to go. They're going to like Berserkers and Transports, Iron Hair Hearthguard, and melee characters, particularly that Iron Hair Champion. Moving on, we have the Ymir Conglomerates. This league in their snazzy red armour brings some of the finest weapons and armour to bear on the battlefield. The Ymir are known to be the greatest craftsmen amongst all the leagues, their Brokir Iron Masters are second to none, and their holdings are incredibly mineral rich, allowing them to mass produce these technological marvels at scale. Their well supplied and well equipped fleets and armies are well known for their traders and pioneer fleets. They're in a fortunate position within the league, able to trade their technological marvels for even more wealth and resources and ever grow their material might. Some of their Brockiers have been known to experiment with dangerous technologies though, and on at least one occasion an entire hold has been lost due to a technological wonder gone out of control. On the battlefield, their soldiers are better equipped than just about any other league, even their standard Hearthkin warriors are armed with superior weaponry, and armour interwoven with many small force field generators. Their beam weapons are also particularly dangerous, the Emir have managed to amass this advanced technology far more than the other leagues. On the table, the Immer Conglomerate are looking very strong indeed. Their league customs are perhaps some of the most universally helpful, with an extra 4 inch range to their guns, which is really relevant on short range Votan units. And then crazily, their entire army gets a 5 plus invul save, which goes up to a 4 plus on 2 plus save units like the Land Fortress and the Iron Hair Hearthguard. It's probably most useful on lower save units though, particularly the Chthonian Berserks absolutely love that, and it helps out the standard Hearthkin Warriors and bikes to no end. As well as that, their shooting gets a bit better as they get AP-1 for attacking a unit with a judgement token that's within half range. It's not always going to be relevant, but when that is, going up from AP-2 to AP-3 is really nice, particularly if you're fighting Armour of Contempt. Their other benefits are okay as well. Their Warlord trait gets them the ability to get plus 1 damage on their non-relic weapons. That can actually be fairly good on the Iron Hair Champion's Axe. 8 attacks at mid-strength and damage 2 would certainly purge some elites. Their relic is the last crest of Jellog. A 4 plus save against mortal wounds and a 3 plus invul for one phase, not a bad defensive one if you want one. And finally for one command point they've got a beam weapon stratagem. Choose one beam weapon in the shooting phase and when it fires each hit it gets also deals a mortal wound as well. If you can get in a position to line up multiple different units along that beam weapons course then that could add up to be a reasonable amount of mortal wounds for the cost. In game I do feel they're probably one of the strongest leagues going at the moment. Range matters a lot within the army as it is one of their major weaknesses. Army wide invuls is pretty crazy. The shooting buff won't come up all the time but when it does it will be helpful. And an extra easy conversion to mortal wounds is okay if you do have a beam weapon or two thrown in. I think there isn't really any unit that they don't help out a fair bit. But I feel that things like Hearthkin Warriors, the Bikes and the Berserks for the invul saves are all going to be extra nice. Plus including at least one or two beam weapons in the army I think it's going to be worth it just for if you can get that stratagem off in a big way. 4 plus invul saves on land fortresses also don't seem terrible at all. Next up we have the Urani Surta Regulates, commonly abbreviated to Ursa, U-R-S-R. These kinsmen are stoic frugal defenders of their realms. 
willing to make ultimate sacrifices to make sure their worlds are held and defy any invaders, and do so almost to a fault amongst the other kin, who generally see no disadvantage to sounding a retreat if they are faced with overwhelming odds, and all that's going to happen from a battle is for them to lose valuable resources to strike back. Perhaps this is a result of their territory being rather exposed, and has frequently suffered devastating incursions from various other 40k Xenos races. Much of their territory was laid waste by the Tyranids, and more recently by newly awakened Necron forces. For any would-be invader though, the worlds of the Regulates do pose a pretty daunting prospect. Highly armed and stoic dauntless kinsmen who are willing to fight to the absolute bitter end will generally mean that the invaders have to pay a very heavy price to take their worlds. It's rumoured that this attitude might not just purely be stubbornness of the dwarves within the Regulates, and in truth they might be guarding something that they just absolutely cannot afford to lose, making every single battle into a last stand out of necessity. When engaged, as expected, Ursa forces are dauntless regardless of the odds of victory. Their kinsmen and war machines fight to their last breath, and captives are very rarely taken, the last remnants of the squads preferring to go down in a blaze of glory rather than submit to enemy victory. On the table, this all gets manifested in plus one toughness, another pretty crazy defensive buff to have across the entire league. It means that everything will be toughness 5 or above, and it gets some units to really interesting toughness brackets, such as Sagittors going up to toughness 8, and Land Fortresses to a crazy toughness 9. They also get to reroll Fail Morale, which does make sense with their lore. Occasionally I think that will be relevant. It might well serve to make the difference of keeping the last few members of a squad in the fight. The toughness thing I think is the main draw though. Otherwise, their Ancestral Judgment means that whenever they attack a unit, they count as one Judgment token, even when it might have zero. That means they'll always get to auto-wound on a 6+, plus, but it perhaps does make it a little bit demotivational to try and throw Judgment tokens out with cars and things, as at least the first one won't get you any additional benefit. I guess their tactics could be to throw multiple Judgment tokens on one unit, and then just embrace the free ones for the rest of the army. Otherwise, they've got a Warlord trait for a 5+, plus feel no pain, Certainly seems a solid defensive one, good man iron here champion I think. Their relic is the abiding mantle, a unit can't be shot unless it's the closest target. Perhaps a bit underwhelming, I think usually lookout circle could be fine, though I suppose it could theoretically help you take some isolated objectives with cheap characters. And finally for one CP they've got waste not your last breath, this is fights and death for a character that hadn't fought yet this phase. It means that it could be very daunting to try and take out one of their fighty characters in melee rather than at range. Overall strength, I'd say, is moderate to strong. By far the best bit is their plus one toughness, I think, which does kind of help out with the Votan type's playstyle, often having to endure an enemy attack before hitting back very, very hard. It's good for the vast majority of things. I think Hearthkin Warriors will quite like it, though I think it is particularly standout if you're going very heavy into vehicles. If you want loads of Sagittors and Land Fortresses, I think that this is perhaps one of the standout leagues. You could also get those Exo Armour Suits all the way up to Toughness 7 if you also cast Fortify on them. It's pretty nuts to get infantry models as tough as vehicles, even if they do only have two wounds. Overall, maybe a bit less general purpose than some of the others, but still good. Next up, we've got the Trans-Hyperion Alliance, who perhaps operate the most differently to any of the above leagues. They're a scattered and far-flung league, with holdings across the Galactic Core, fairly isolated, and plenty of them venture beyond in nomadic spacefaring vessels. They maintain contact and protect their network of Votan with arcane communication technology, which allows some impressive coordination both across the stars and on the battlefield. The main driver for the Trans-Hyperion Alliance's nomadic ways is to seek out and obtain extra knowledge for their ancestor cores, feeding everything back into the Votan, to obtain great advantages in terms of strategy and tactics compared with the other leagues. In battle, they will generally need to make very good use of this knowledge though. Due to their scattered nature, their individual fleets will often be fighting in isolation with somewhat limited supplies. Every warrior and war machine must be exploited to its maximal potential, and they generally must attempt to eliminate the enemy quickly and avoid losses where possible. In game, this all manifests itself as the league being quite a general all-rounder type league. On modified sixes to hit, cause an extra AP-1 on their target, not at all bad with judgement tokens, and that should add up to some extra failed saves across the enemy force. On top of that, any units that are depleted but not destroyed get plus one to hit, a bit on the niche side, but that does mean that some of their squads will be hitting a bit better. This isn't really something that's easy to rely on though, as it does depend on your opponent triggering it. Finally, their ancestral judgement is a small damage boost to judgement tokens. If you're attacking a unit that has at least one, then you get to reroll wound rolls of one against them. It is an okay damage boost, but it will bear in mind that if you have lots of judgement tokens on a unit, you might be getting a whole load of auto wounds anyway, and it might be less relevant. 
I'd say their passive buffs are helpful to just about most units, but rarely all that stand out. They maybe don't seem to be a terrible one if you want a fairly mixed force, and you're not going down any one particular strategy in a big way. Otherwise though, I think their support options are actually quite good. Their Warlord trait allows them to redeploy three units at the start of the game, or put them in strategic reserve for free. Positioning really is quite a big deal with Leagues of Votan, so that really is an excellent option, pretty much an auto include if you're running the faction. Their relic is the Corv Days, this is a Grimner upgrade that makes their Corvs a bit tougher, and also gives them plus one to deny, and you can deny one extra power, a nice bit of extra psychic defence there, probably also worth taking if you are running a Grimnir. Finally, they do get a 1 command point save for a 5 plus against mortal wounds. This is really good on a faction that's generally really quite susceptible to mortal wounds. Having that to pull out the bag just when you need it is going to save you a fair few wounds on your forces, particularly for factions that like to spam them big, say Thousand Suns. Overall though, despite the good support options, I'd say they're probably one of the weaker of the big leagues. The generalist damage buff is okay, but not particularly standout. And I think actually the stratagem and the warlord traits are maybe the bigger draws to play the league in general. Overall, they look like a league though that's solid with most units. Maybe the low AP ones might gain a little bit more than most due to that extra AP on sixes. Finally, the Votan Codex also gives the option to field custom leagues. Within the Galactic Core, there are many, many other smaller leagues of various sizes and power, ranging from individual kinholds to sprawling empires to rival the other great ones. Of course, in game you always have the option just to paint a league how you like and use whatever rules you want, but it's quite fun that there are some custom options to represent other leagues should you wish to fill them. In game, this is represented by getting to pick two customs and an ancestral judgement from a list. For the most part, I'm not sure if they quite outweigh the advantages of getting warlord traits, relics and stratagems from the great leagues, but some of the combos do look pretty interesting, at least on paper. Out of the customs, a few of them are a bit on the weak side, but you can combine some of the strong options. The plus 4 inch to range stolen from the Emir really is quite nice, that's going to be handy on a whole load of guns. And you can also borrow the single reroll either to hit or wound from the Greater Therian League. Those two combined looks pretty solid for a ranged damage dealing army. Otherwise there's a few other fun ones, a plus 1 strength to beam weapons, and the core burster stratagem going to 0 CP for some mortal wounds. And there's one for a 2 plus move to vehicles and accelerated units. Not at all bad for an otherwise slightly slow faction, though I do wonder whether or not you still might be better off going Irani Serta regulates for the extra toughness. Besides that, you get some sort of ancestral judgement for a judgement token mechanic. Perhaps one of the most interesting might be enemies gaining two judgement tokens rather than one for killing a Votan unit. That is going to be a meaningful number. Auto wounding on fives for guaranteed after that is very nice indeed. Otherwise, there's a charge boost for plus two to charge judgement token units. That seems to be one of the best ways that you can get extra threat range on Votan melee units, a real rarity in the codex. And there's one that could just hand out a few more judgement tokens simply by doing what you want to do anyway. When you're shooting, if you don't split fire, then on a 5+, plus the target gains a judgement token, a 4+, plus if the unit happens to be below half strength. Overall, I think that these are usable, the extra range and the reroll are both great, and then combine that with any one of the better judgement token things. Still probably not quite as strong as the major leagues though. So with custom leagues talked about, there we have an overview of the leagues of Votan and some of the advantages and disadvantages of running each. Let me know which one out of any you're eyeing up at the moment, either for lore or gameplay. It'll be interesting to hear what sort of paths people are thinking about going down, down in the comments. If you've enjoyed the video, feel free to subscribe to All Spets Tactics, where I'll certainly keep the regular 40k videos coming. I'm sure we'll have plenty more for the leagues of Votan over the next few days and weeks. Finally, if you have been enjoying all the videos on the channel, I would just like to mention that Allspex Tactics does have a Patreon page as well, and you can find that down in the video description below. The Patreon page is what allows me to keep on making videos like this quite so regularly, so if you are enjoying a lot, then any support is massively appreciated. Channel patrons do get a fair few advantages, seeing certain videos early each week, regular votes to see what sort of things happen next on the channel, and automatic entry into the regular prize giveaways with a chance to win some really big model kits each month. If any of that sounds good to you or you'd just like to help support, the link is down in the video description. In any case, a massive thank you for listening and I'll hope to see you guys next time.